are now listening to the Serious Growth Podcast with your host, Leo Costa Jr. I see you're taking your, uh, some time out of running to talk to me. Yeah. Thank you, very, thank you very much for doing that. <laughs> I appreciate you having me. You have a long way to go, it looks like. Yeah, I've ran 1,800 miles since April 27th, so 18, got 1,200. 1,800 1, miles. Left. Well, and where did you start? I started in Wilmington, North Carolina. Wilmington, my goodness. Hey, do you have a, I did a, a one time I did this, uh, I got into bike riding, bicycle riding. Uh-huh. And I did a 200 mile ride. I mean, that's okay. child's play compared to what you're doing. I know that. No. But it, <laughs> no. it, it, it's all relative. I'm, I'm 200 pounds and me being on a bicycle is like a bumblebee trying to fly. It doesn't work for Yeah. Me. Anyway, <laughs> but I had somebody that was always with me, like back there. Do you have oh, that? Oh, behind you, have some, you? Yeah. Do you have some support like that? Nobody's, nobody's following me. No. Um, my fiance is out here and she uh, goes to like hotels and works all day. Yeah. And then like, if I need her, she'll pick me up at the end of the day. If not, oh. then I'll run, run all the way to the hotel. But there were like uh, a couple weeks where I ran by myself um, with a pack on 25 pound pack and uh, just ran from like hotel to hotel. So unbelievable. Uh, yeah. So. Well, listen, welcome to serious growth podcast. Uh, the mission here usually is to try to tell the truth or a version of the truth, even if it hurts people's feelings. So don't, you know, don't hold back is uh, my point. Okay. Yeah. But uh, I see here, you're obviously you're, you're running across, is it across America or how many miles are you running? Yeah. I'm running from Wilmington, North Carolina to um, San Francisco, California for veterans. Yeah. Yeah. And I see here in your bio that you, you got into the, the military um, at a very young age, you said that you you don't want to go too deep into your, uh, the reason why, but you had a rough childhood. And yeah. I don't know if you want to talk about some of that roughness, but wh why was it so rough that you got yourself into being a, is it a Marine at 17? Yeah. So, um, so I moved, my family moved every year, uh, just about every eight months growing up. Uh, my parents were just kind of fi trying to find the perfect place or whatever, um, which is, it doesn't exist. So, um, it was mainly a financial thing. We'd, my parents would like run up bills in a certain town and then we would move to a different town. And my, my stepfather was a, like a supervisor, like maintenance technician at like uh, apartment complexes. So yeah. there's always jobs in different States and stuff like that. Yeah. So we would just move a lot, but then there was like a, a, a pretty large issue that happened with a, like a family member that I uh, probably shouldn't go into too, yeah. uh, too much detail yet. But, uh, the, but yeah. the, straw, the straw that broke the camel's back, so to speak? Yeah, there was just a lot of isolation um, from why well, I just didn't have like that tribe that, that tribe that most people grow up with, you know, those friends um, or family members that you just see on a constant like basis. Yeah. And then um, around 11 years old, something, something pretty terrible happened to where I didn't really communicate with my family at all either. So then I was just kind of completely isolated from yeah. just about everybody. And, yeah. uh, and we kept moving every, every eight months. I went to four different high schools and that makes uh, it tough. And I, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. my parents, they, they split up when I was young and I went to like a few different schools, but it was like kind of in the area, you know, it wasn't yeah, yeah. so that I, it was still a little bit difficult, but I mean, you know, to be constantly on the move like that, you know, there definitely are, there's some challenges to that for sure yeah. when you're that, yeah. that age. But, but looking at it now, it's more of a blessing because uh, this doesn't bother me at all running across America and staying in different hotels every night or staying on the side of the road yeah. or anything like that. Like it, my fiance is like super homesick. So, well, you know, <laughs> so, it's, yeah. it's, it's funny, not funny necessarily, but it's interesting how certain things that you think are bad end up being good and vice versa. Yeah. It, it's yeah. really weird that way, you know? Yeah. And, and yeah. I think some of that has to do with how you end up uh, not only perceiving it, but how you respond to that, you know, yes. I guess you can just, you know, I had some issues, health issues. And basically I talked about it in my book. It was like, you know, adversity either defines or destroys you. And, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of times, you know, you don't have a choice, but when you do have that choice, if you take that where it's going to not destroy you, then real, some interesting things happen. I mean, uh, you learn about yourself in a lot of ways. Yeah, definitely. Say. Yeah. yeah. So you got into the Marines at, at 17 years of age. Yeah. And did you have any idea? I mean, did you just, was it like a, a place that you thought I need to go and escape from all the madness that I'm at and the yeah. Marine sounds like the best choice? Is that how that happened? So I just, honestly, uh, I wanted to be a Navy SEAL. Um, so I was, uh, I would wake up at 4am every morning, uh, my junior and senior year in high school 
and uh, and go for like eight, 10 mile runs and then um, and then do my swimming and my you know, push-ups and all that stuff. There's like a training program, Navy SEAL, like pre-training program. Yeah. And, uh, and, and so I was training for that. I wasn't, I never even thought about the Marines once. And uh, I don't know how they find out your phone number, but the Marine Corps has your phone number at 17. And, uh, and they gave me a call on my birthday. And they were really? like, hey, yeah, yeah. And they wanted me to come in and talk to the recruiter. And I laughed at the guy. I was like, nah, man, I'm going to be a Navy SEAL. And he kind of laughed back like, okay, yeah, right. And he's like, come on, in, come on in and talk to me. And I went in there, man, and he was like a car salesman. Like he had me signing papers in like 15 <laughs> minutes. Like he asked, he asked me like, what do you want out of life? And he was like, he put these like cards in front of me. And he was like, it, like some of them said like honor, courage, commitment, brotherhood, sense of purpose, like all this stuff. And he's like, order these, you know, from one to 10 or whatever with the, the, the most important on top. And I wanted like a sense of purpose and commitment and brotherhood because I had never been, you know, I never had that growing up. And so like, I put those on there and he's like, so, so why wouldn't you go ahead and join today? And I was right. like, I have no wow. reasons for you, man. Yeah. So I signed those papers like that day. No yeah. kidding. And this was for, yeah. the, but this was for Navy or for the Marines? This is, this is the Marine Corps. Oh, Marine, yeah. Marine Corps. Yeah. 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 <laughs> you know, I just want to say something. I, I'm, I'm really pro military. I mean, believe me, but in yeah. that instance right there that you're talking about, I yeah. almost think that's just a little bit disingenuous because you got a 17 year old kid yeah. who, knows, who knows nothing. I'm there's no offense, yeah. to you, but no, nobody yeah. knows yeah. anything at 17. As far as I'm no. Yeah. You got this guy over here. Who's got a lot of probably more age on you. Oh, for sure. And experience, yeah. And he knows how he's preying on you a little bit. Oh, oh. for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So, and, and, I, and I, and I, and I, and, and I don't know if they have, if they purposely go after like the poor neighborhoods and stuff like that, but yeah, I was in that neighborhood. So like, Ooh. yeah. So, so yeah. But, uh, and, and the part of me, like, I think about that too, like what you just said, but like without that, like I wasn't going to college. I graduated high school with a 2.2 GPA. I went to four schools. I went to over 20 schools growing up. Like I didn't care about school. Like I yeah. just, I never, and my parents didn't, I didn't have a household that like, you know, made sure like my grades were doing well or anything yeah. like that so and I worked full-time like in high school so like that was more important to me than work and then school so um, without the Marine Corps like I would probably be working as a manager at like Domino's or something so. there you go you know something <laughs> school is not for everybody it really isn't yeah you know you'd like yeah. to think it, it would be but it, the truth is it's not and in this case it really worked out it sounds like it worked out way oh, better for, sure. for you you know yeah yeah, so and it needed to, it had to give me the discipline to be able to go to school later on, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Was it a, was it a pretty big shock for you when you went into the Marines? Yeah, I mean, I really didn't know. I was kind of ignorant of like the world and like, at, in general at all. I really didn't know we were at war. Like, I knew we were at war, but I didn't really know we were at war. Like, yeah. kind of thing. I knew I wanted to go to war, but I didn't really know why. I knew I wanted to fight for like America, but I didn't really know why we were at war or anything like that. Yeah. So it was kind of it was kind of wild um, when we got to boot camp and then we got to SOI, which is like um, the school of infantry where they teach you like how to be an infantryman because that's what I was. Um, and uh, and and then like at the very end, they're like, okay, we're well, going to this unit. This unit, they like assign you to units, and they're yeah. like, oh, well, you guys are going to Afghanistan like tomorrow. And no, they, it wasn't it wasn't us. There was like oh. another guy. Yeah. So. Um, but like at, at that moment, like when they were telling people that, because they hadn't told me where I was going yet, and they were yeah. telling other people that, that was kind of the moment where you're like, oh wait, like this is real. Like, yeah, this is no, no. really real. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. But I, fortunately for me, I had a, like about a year before I got, I had to go to Afghanistan. So we had plenty of training like in the fleet before that. So. And now a word from our sponsor. Do you want a bone crushing grip? Good, because you're gonna get one with the amazing new TRS Gripper. It's a progressive grip builder with longer handles and a special ergonomic design that's like a dozen hand grippers in one. Start off easy and work your way up to quickly build your grip strength from wet noodle to pulverizing. The package includes a video from the world famous strength coach, Dr. Russ Horine, the man who worked with Leo Costa to help bring you big beyond belief in the Bulgarian power burst. Dr. Horine shows you a simple and easy to follow workout plan that takes just minutes a day right from in front of your TV set if you want. So click on the link below and let's get started building you a stronger, firmer, bone crushing grip. So infantry, you know, again, I'm 
uh, the does that mean that you're boots on the ground? Boots on the ground in combat on yeah. uh, combat patrols on foot. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I don't know how. I'm just amazed that people that that do that that kind of work, whether policing or military. You know, yeah. I'm not a I'm not a chicken, but I I can never see myself doing that, John. I'm sorry. I mean, uh, yeah. Uh, so I just I can't see myself doing that. And then for you to and people like yourself to yeah. be willing to to do that, I'm sh I'm amazed and I mean I'm honored yeah. the fact that somebody somebody like you would do that for me. Okay. Yeah, I mean I think the Marine Corps kind of numbs you to it to where to the point where when you finally do get shot at you don't freak out right like you don't freak out when you get shot at the first uh, time i did not get, i did not freak out i uh, uh there were some people like the younger guys um because i actually the first tour i didn't i didn't see combat the first tour we went on a mew where you go on a boat and you like train other militaries so we went to like jordan and train their military and uh, okay. we went to haiti during the earthquake in 2008 and and help them like passed out rice and stuff like that yeah. uh, but then like when i got to afghanistan i was actually in charge so um i was an infantry squad leader so i led a squad of marines in afghanistan and I mean, at that point, I had I had three years of like just drills and drills and drills, like where you go to the desert and they just like yeah. you're pretending like you're in Afghanistan. And, yeah. and when you get there, that's how you're supposed to act. And the training just kicked in instantly. Like I didn't think about it twice. But like there were guys with me that after the first very first firefight, they couldn't drink their water. They were just like <laughs> shivering like this. Like it was pretty wild. But they were like, you know, they were still 18, 19 when they yeah. went. So um, so I, I was 21 at that point. So I, I actually took over a squad of marines on my 21st birthday i saw uh, that I was, I, I saw yeah that. So, somebody <laughs> yeah. else couldn't handle it so they kind of they threw you yeah in there. yeah i was a sergeant um so in the marines it's kind of weird um infantry gets promoted the like the slowest um but you can go to any other like uh job essentially and um and you can get promoted to sergeant within like two years and so sometimes those guys get transferred back into the infantry they go to like special force or spe um I forget what security forces where they go like guard the president and stuff yeah, like that. Like yeah. you see them in pictures. Um, so they get promoted really fast because the president, when you're guarding the president, they want you to have like a nice little stack of you know, their, their um, rank oh, yeah. or whatever. Look, it looks better. Right. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Um, so then they come back to the infantry and then they're like, Oh, they're sergeants. And they should get put in charge, but yeah. they don't know anything about the infantry. So, yeah. So, so that's pretty much what happened. Um, he took over. He didn't know what he was doing. I had been to squad leaders course, so I actually knew how to run a squad. And I was only a Lance Corporal, which is like an E3. So that's nothing like yeah. in the Marine Corps. But an E3 in infantry knows everything pretty much. Yeah. So, um, And so I got meritoriously promoted to Corporal on my 21st birthday. But still, Corporals are only supposed to be team leaders. I was already a team leader. So they made me a squad leader as a Corporal. And that that's supposed to be a sergeant's building. So, so what, it was what's pretty the, wild. What's the, what's the difference between a team uh, and squad leader? Yeah, so it was a uh, squad of Marines is broken down um, into uh, into twelve, um, and so uh, there's three teams and then the squad leader. So each team is uh, is uh, four Marines, and then so they run like a team leader runs that team, but it's I under see. the squad, and then I, I run see. the actual squad. Um, yeah, so so that's. Yeah, so the, <laughs> but the, we lived on patrol bases in Afghanistan. So like, essentially, there was only like two or three squads on a base. It wasn't yeah. like the big the big camps where they have like AC and chow halls and stuff like that. Yeah. Like I, we we were living in the dirt. Like we were actually digging into the ground, sleeping like in holes and stuff like that. Like going on like really long like nine hour patrols and no getting coppered into places. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's a different it's a different experience. Um, yeah. So I would imagine something like that changes you for the rest of your life oh for sure yeah like um because the first the very first firefight like i was the young, the youngest squad leader and um and i'd never seen combat before and i had to like lead guys that had also never seen combat before and uh i mean it was wild it was a nine hour a nine hour patrol uh they were we got ambushed like three times oh, <laughs> like, crap. like it was insane and we were just out there doing census where you like go house to house and just kind of take everybody's names down that's yeah. that's all they want you really doing um unless it's like super heavy and we just moved to this area and um yeah i mean it was it was freaking it was crazy man <laughs> like, hey, do, you, um, do, you, do, yeah. do guys like uh you know if they like the ones that you're saying that they sh they shook did you yeah. have those guys that just it was just too much and that they just even though they signed up for four years or whatever they just yeah. that wasn't the place that they needed to be you had to get them so to go out no nah, man like well there were some people that left after but like um 
you really can't, you don't, you don't really have a choice in the military, like in the Marines, especially like four years you signed up. If you like, um, if you so, break no, down after like that or yeah. something, like you break down, they can put you in H and S, which is like headquarters. So you'll do like paperwork and stuff. Yeah. Um, but, but push not push really, that doesn't happen too often. Cause like I said, you're trained to such a high extent to where like you're supposed to essentially be numb when something like that happens. Um, and those guys, like that was the first one. So they were, you know, kind of shook up. Yeah. Um, and, but like later on they were fine and, and most of them were fine. The, the, the funniest thing was that, that we had an interpreter with us and, uh, and he tried to run. Uh, like, <laughs> oh, wait. Yeah, so, yeah, so our, so our doc, uh, we have corpsmen with us and they're, they're in the Navy, but they're essentially Marines. Um, and they're out there to like, you know, save us if we're, you know, we get shot. And so, the, the doc actually jumped on to the interpreter, got on top of him to like protect him and uh, lay, laid down fire. So that was pretty intense. No yeah. kidding. Yeah. yeah. He got a, he got an award for that. So <laughs> that's, that's some yeah. wild stuff. I have a buddy of mine that was in the military. He told me, he says, I actually feel um, more calm when there's uh, gunfire going through by my head. And I just, yeah. Like, and I know so, he, he's not telling me a lie. I know the guy well enough. Yeah. He, he, he said, that's no, why I feel the most comfortable. I was so like, it took me about, and it felt like minutes, but like this guy, he was a sniper and, um, and we hadn't seen in combat yet. So I was just thinking like, he was just talking, you know, and he's like, I think you guys are about to get in a firefight. And I was like, all right, whatever, man. And, uh, cause we had been there for four months at this point and we hadn't seen it. Like there were firefights like between like the Afghani police and stuff like that. Yeah. And we went and helped, but it was nothing like directed at us because yeah. this place had already been cleared essentially. Um, and so like, he said it ha was happening. I was like, I don't know. And so we're just kind of, I was very complacent. And, um, and so, um, so I'm just standing there and then like not even a minute later, machine gun like oh. fire starts like pointed toward us and toward another, um, part of my squad. We were split up into two teams and, uh, and they started laying down fire on both of us. And like within, it felt like minutes, like where I was thinking about, like it was a split second decision. And like, it's almost like a, a video game. Like yeah. I, I was like, we couldn't go into this building because the building hadn't been cleared yet. And the building that we were at had been blown up by an IED the day before. Um, and so we, we did have to deal with that. Um, like, uh, improvised explosive devices, like, um, just laid in like buildings and stuff, just waiting for you to step on. And so we couldn't go into the building. So I was like, I just yelled peel and we had done this in training maybe like 20 times, but like, you know, if, you never know if you're actually going to use it, but I literally run behind this building and like, I'm the first one out. And so you, I jump out and get on the ground and start laying down fire. And then the next person runs behind me, gets online. The next person runs behind him and gets online and we all get online. And then we start bounding and moving like online fire and move fire and move like toward the enemy. Like that's what we're trained to do oh, as Marines. Man. Yeah. So we're five rounds are coming down toward us. We're running straight to them. And then we finally get online with the other team that was like, had machine gun fire like on them the whole time like it was it was the craziest thing but like in my head like i was not there like i was like this i'm leading a squad like that's it yeah um you and have, uh, you, you have to revert back to your training when it comes down to stuff like that yeah yeah you know so, yeah. it's it's, uh, it's it's like that i mean there's no comparison i'm i'm, I'm an athlete and i know yeah. that when when i was put in certain situations you know at first the game was really fast but then the more reps that I did, which is what you're talking about, yeah. the, game, the game actually slows down and you can be amazingly productive, even though that chaos is all around you. It's hard to believe that, but it's, it's, yeah. I'm sure that you, uh, you experience the same thing. But it sounds yeah, like, you know, it's almost like a high too. Yeah. yeah like, yeah. Like your, your friend was saying, like, I mean, you're just in the zone and like, there's no, you can't be focused on anything else because it's life or death at that point. Uh, I, I, had uh, a, I went to a gun show one time uh, a long yeah. time ago and I happened to be around some guys that were, X Delta, you know, military. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, they were just you know, in a circle. They're just talking. And one of the guys there, he said, you know, it's been 10 days since I've killed anybody. I'm getting the itch that I need to, I need to go. You know, it's like almost like that addiction. Yeah. You know, yeah. I, 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 I heard him say that. Oh, my goodness. These guys yeah. operate a little bit differently than I do. My, my mindset. That's intense. Yeah. It really wow. is. So, okay. So you're in the Marines and you're, you're a squad leader. So tell yeah. me, tell me what happens from there. You, uh, you know, where did you go from there? Yeah, so um, so it, I never really saw myself leaving the the Marines. Um, after one of our firefights in Afghanistan, um, a uh, the the XO an officer came up to me, and 
and this guy didn't really like me too much. Um, he didn't Why? want me to get like meritoriously promoted. I was in his squad or I was in his platoon, like the, um, when I was younger, uh, when I was like 19, he was like our platoon, um, leader. And, uh, and he just didn't think I'm like a very, I'm like a shy dude. Like I, I'm very introverted. I, I grew up like by myself essentially because I was always in different, um, different schools and stuff. So like, I wasn't, very like I wasn't like outgoing you know what I mean yeah. and it didn't really seem like I was a introverted leader so like I could definitely like lead um yeah. but like I wasn't that outgoing like oh. out there you know and he, he wanted rah, somebody rah, to, yeah yeah yeah, yeah, like yeah. That. yeah I get so that. so I think that's what he wanted and um and so he came up to me after one of these firefights and he pulls me aside and he's like look and he's you know he's an officer so he's been to college he understands a little bit more about the world and uh and he essentially yeah. tells me like hey like you could have just got everybody killed for no reason. Like, uh, these are farmers out here. It's not Taliban. Like you, like, and in my head, this is blowing my mind because uh, for the last four years, all I've been taught is Taliban is bad. You know, we need to go out there and like, and, and destroy the enemy so that these people can be at peace. And then he comes in here and says like, you just were in a nine hour firefight for no reason. Uh, it's just farmers trying to protect their land. Like, like wow. there's no there's no reason to be doing any of this like you're just you know like you should have came back after the first firefight there's no reason for you to continue and i'm sitting here thinking like well we're trying to you know destroy the enemy so that when? they're I'm not they're win. not out yeah they're not out here anymore yeah. and like and he pretty much was just like that's not why we're here and i was so like it like it messed me up so much like in my head uh where i just didn't think like any like i was so confused you know like i was like i thought that's what we were here to do yeah. and he's saying that we're not so i was like i'm gonna get out so i got out of the marines um went to college and i took like a bunch of like sociology and psychology classes and the and then a public speaking course where essentially they all told me like you can't talk like that you can't speak like that like like essentially how we talk in the marines yeah. um and then like they're, and then in, you know sociology psychology they're just like talking about like all the negatives about the military and like and like how like you know you know women don't have rights and you know and then and everything about equality and like all like and stuff like i'd never heard before and I, and yeah. so and and uh, and, and you know a lot of it is true and a lot of it is just like the teachers are kind of stuffed that down your throat and like and it like messed me up so i actually gave up everything that i owned from the that i had that i had um gotten from the marines so like any money that i made like to, and bought anything with it like i gave it all away i was like i can't i don't think i deserve any of this like i think that what we did over there might have been wrong like i'm not sure and so like i literally like went and i lived in a garage for um for six months and just trained people for free in local parks like i was pretty much like like I, like I wasn't like a dirty hippie or anything. Like I was uh -huh. clean, but like, I literally like just trained people fitness wise for free in parks. Like that's all I did. I dropped out of school and I was just like, I can't like, I don't know. Like, I feel like everything I like the GI bill I was like, I don't think I rate that. Like, I don't think that was right. Like it was yeah. crazy. It's, it's um, amazing that you get to that point and yet you were serving. I mean, I mean, honorably. And, but yeah, I mean, I knew I had to serve people. Like I ne never questioned that. And I thought that's why I joined the Marines. And so like when they put that in question, like that, like that, that wasn't actually service to, you know, mankind, yeah. you know, then, then I was like, well, I have to like write that. So, and, and to do that, I felt like, um, I had to do that. But then I ended up going on this, I biked from uh, Wilmington, North Carolina to Tampa, Florida, 700 miles. It was kind of supposed to be like a, finding myself journey kind of thing. Yeah. And, um, and I got down there and I hadn't seen my family in years. Um, and so I was like going to reconcile with my family. And, uh, and so I, I stopped and I, I met, uh, you know, I went to my parents' house or their apartment. Um, and they didn't have a car, you know, they could barely afford like, you know, like groceries and stuff like that. Like it was, it was crazy. And I was just like, what the heck? Like, I'm going to end up like this because I'm living in a garage and I'm not yeah. going to school. And I'm <laughs> like, like, I don't want anything to do with this. So like I gave them my bike. It was like a touring bike um, suit, like it's nice little like touring bike. Um, and so like sell to like buy like a, like a beater car or something. Cause the bike was worth like a thousand dollars. And, um, and I flew back, um, to, to North Carolina and I got, like, I begged the school, the community college to let me back in. Um, I begged my veteran friend who I had gotten out of the Marine Corps to let me like to move into another apartment so I could have a room again, like, so that I didn't have to live like in the garage. Yeah. <laughs> and cause I was, it was like a separated garage. I was like, I completely separated myself from everybody. I, I showed every sign of like, 
like veteran suicide awareness that like exists. Like I gave everything away. I distanced myself from everybody. Like I, but I never like, I never thought about that at all. But I'm like, gonna, I'm just going to ask yeah. you if you actually thought <laughs> yeah. about that. No, I never did. But like, if you look at the list of like signs, um, I, I exhibited every single one of them. It was, it was wild. And nobody like reached out to me, which is actually like a, one of the big, the big concerns I have and, and why I'm raising awareness for veteran suicide is because like this, like this is, this isn't the only time this had happened to me. Like I had been depressed later on about different things um, after graduating college um, and, and nobody, and, and the veterans that I talked to, I talked to them since I've been out here and they noticed and they didn't say anything because they didn't know how to say it. Yeah. And that is like, that's a huge disservice because like, I mean, like that veteran, like you have no idea, like he could be struggling to the point where it's actually at that level. I was never anywhere near there because I never even considered it. But like, if it had been a different person, you know, then I mean, they could have taken their life and, and, and that could have been prevented, you know, with a conversation. So, you know, I have a question for you because I have a personal training studio and there for a while, what I did is I offered for free veterans yeah. because I, I knew or I learned that veterans had a hard time transitioning from coming from combat into civilian life. Yeah. And so my, my way of giving back was to offer the training for them because I thought, you know, it would be good for our discipline. It'd be good for different yeah. reasons. And yeah. so the, there's a part of going to being in, in the military is having this problem of people with um, struggling with uh, mm -hmm. mental issues and yeah do they have a or did they have and is it better now did they have somebody that can help when you leave the military or just when you leave they say hey thanks a lot for your service see you later <laughs> so there's like a, a week long like separation class that you take and it like there's you're supposed to like make your resume and do all that but like it is the most boring thing i've ever been to in my life and, and it's like a class there's like 500 600 people in it and like it's like as a Marine, like I wasn't paying attention to anything that they were saying. They didn't, nothing seemed irrelevant, you know? And then I was diagnosed with PTSD. Um, I saw a psychiatrist before I left and, and he was like, you need this, 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 like, like, I don't even know. I think he said like four different pills that I needed for my anxiety and PTSD. And I was like, I'm not taking any of that. And he was like, why won't you take it? You know? And I was like, cause, and I was like, cause I don't want to be addicted to any of that like stuff. And, um, and he's like, well, it's not addictive. Like, you know, it's just going to get you through whatever. And I was just so against it. I was like, I'm not, gonna, I'm just not going to do that. And so like, until like I found, and there's tons of like nonprofits that focus on like that kind of stuff. Um, after all that trip and everything, and I came back, like a friend invited me to do yoga and, um, and, and I did like, I did yoga six days a week, every week for like two years. And that's like how I essentially like pushed down the PTSD, like, like I, I was there like every day, like an hour and a half every single day. Like I couldn't, I could, didn't miss it like that. And then running as well. But, um, but really the yoga was more of a focus at that. But like, as far as like making sure, like, you know, that you stay like fit and well and, and, or like, you know, anything like that, like they don't talk about any of that stuff in separation, but like, it's so, it's so focused on when you're in, you know, that the second that you stop doing that second, you stop waking up at five in the morning and going on these PT runs. Yeah. Um, like it's, you just go into this like funky, like, you know, depressive fate place makes, because it's so ingrained in you, you know, and you yeah. need it at that point, you it makes know, makes no sense to me. You know, the body no. becomes, its, the body becomes its function. And so yeah. you adapt to the environment that you're in. The, I think one of the, the smartest things you probably did, uh, Russell was not getting on those pills. You figured out a different way. Yeah. And you used your body and your mind. And fortunately, yeah. I think that it sounds like to yeah. me, like when you saw your family after so many years, that was kind of a wake up call and maybe a, a crossroad moment for you in your life. It almost sounds like. Yeah, you know? no, it, it really was. Yeah. And I think that the, here I am playing shrink, but I think that the, when you gave, <laughs> when you gave all your stuff away to me, that almost sounds yeah. like a, in, in bodybuilding, uh, we call it wiping the slate clean. In other words, there's uh -huh. all this information that you've learned. And, you know, sometimes it's just not the right information, but you have to be willing to wipe the slate clean so you can kind of start from a fresh pad or oh, yeah. fresh foundation. It almost sounds like you did that, even though those tendencies that you had sounded like you were somebody's going to off yourself for sure. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. Uh, but let me ask you this now. You you did this yoga for, you said, two years, twice a day for two years? Is that what you said? Uh, every day, every six day. days a week for, yeah, for, for two years. And so, then at home too. Yeah. Okay, so... Do you still 
have PTSD? Am I saying that right, or is it PSTD? Yeah, which, which way is uh, it? PT, PTSD. PTSD. So, okay, yeah. Do you still so, have that, and you have to always deal with that, or what happens? So, to I, you know, it, it depends on what doctor you talk to. Like, there's some doctors that say it's acute, like it doesn't last like your whole lifetime. There's no point in like naming it like that. But I think it's because so many veterans struggle, well, and people that like experience, you know, traumatic um, experiences, like they associate their life with that traumatic experience so yeah. much that they can't take it away because their their sense of self is so established in it that, that, that you can't you can't pull it out because that's yeah. who you are. Yeah. Um, and so, like for me, it wasn't just the Marines that did it; it was my childhood, right? Like that built on top of it. Yeah. You know, that's a one-two like, punch. Yeah. So I had to like <laughs> disassociate myself with that. And then also like disassociate myself from the stuff that I experienced in the Marines and like create a new person essentially. Yeah. And so like, I don't feel like I have any of those issues. Like, I mean, I, I definitely like having, you know, anxiety every once in a while. And I don't know, you know, if that's more just like general every day or if it's because I'm like more riled up than a normal person, but I don't think so. Cause it's like compared to an average person, I don't feel like, you know, I have, anxiety like that I think, at all. I think we all have anxiety to <laughs> yeah. some degree and we have those yeah. days that, you know, I think that you've done a fantastic job of reinventing yourself. There's no question about that. I mean, I can see that in the way your demeanor yeah. is and the way you're talking. So, okay. So then you, after that bike ride, then what, and I know that you're running now for uh, veterans and is yeah. it mainly for veterans that are committing suicide or is it just in general? And so, how, how does this cause work and look and why did you decide to run over 3,000 miles. Yeah, so um, so after I got back from that trip, I went back to school, I took all the classes over that I'd failed out of because I just left. Um, ended up getting A's in every single one of them. Uh, with the yoga, I think the yoga and meditation like just completely just changed my mindset on everything. Um, and uh, and I actually ended up graduating with a two point or three two point three point nine GPA. Like I, I was honors, you know, and uh, and Amazing. to graduate, yeah, it was wild. Um, and uh, and I never considered I'm going to college ever. And um, and then after that, like I went into clinical research. I was going to go into project management, project management but I hated it. You know, it was like, uh, in our school, like there's a program, if you're biology, like you can also do clinical research and you'll essentially get, a, uh, you know, a, um, an internship. I got an internship at like a fortune 500 company my junior year. Like I was like, you know, one of the top people in the program and, uh, and I hated every second of it. It was crazy. Uh, but it was like, I knew I would get a job and I knew I would get paid a lot as soon as I graduated. And I did, I got a, great job the second I graduated and, and I hated every second of it but I had two friends from the two uh, veteran friends from the Marines that I was in charge of in, well one of them I was in charge of in Afghanistan and he decided he wanted to be a doctor so he got into Harvard Medical School so now I'm sitting here like oh man like that's like success right yeah. and so then I have another friend who after my other friend got into med school decided he wanted to go to med school um and he actually didn't even really do that great in undergrad um and but he still wanted to be a doctor so he did like this post back program and got his grades up and got all the prereqs and then he got into med school and now i'm sitting here like what am i doing in my life you know yeah. and it was that comparison thing which you should never do yeah. but i really didn't like what i was doing so like to see them doing something that they loved, you know, I was like kind of really upset about that. And that's kind of where I went into like that second like depression. Cause I was yeah. like, what am I doing? Right. So I had all the prereqs. I, you know, got, had all the prereqs for med school already. And I was like, well, you know, that's like the level of success now. So maybe I'll go to med school. Right. And I loved help, helping people, you know, so I figured that would be a, a good alternative to what I was doing. I, I really didn't like pharmaceuticals. I don't like pharmaceuticals. And, uh, and so I working for, you know, phar a pharmaceutical company, which is essentially what I was doing. Um, managing clinical trials isn't really something that's ever going to make me feel fulfilled. Yeah. Um, so I left that job and got <laughs> certified as an EMT, um, took a $12 an hour job to get hours so that I could apply to med school or PA school. And, um, and then like, you know, i had been there a year. You need about a year's worth of experience um, to be a PA um, physician assistant. And, uh, and then like everything with COVID started going down. And, um, and at first, like I was training for a marathon and there's a, there's a pretty cool um, technique to train for a marathon that can reduce your hour or your, your marathon time by an hour in a year. And uh, it's a, it's a heart rate training method. And uh, you run it 100, 180 beats per minute minus your age. 
uh, for, you know, and you just never go over that heart rate ever. Mm. Uh, but you run it, you do, it's a volume training. So you run like a lot but you only run at that heart rate. And then eventually your pace will increase your heart rate. I'll say the same. So I was running for three, three and a half hours every morning before work. Uh, I was waking up at like three 34 in the morning running and then going into work for 10 hours. It's crazy. Um, And then, and so I was thinking a lot while I was, you know, running like that and, um, and then everything with COVID and and I'd realized we were seeing COVID patients and we were, you know, testing um, patients for like the flu and stuff because we didn't have COVID tests at that point. Um, And all the, all the, uh, all the, um, or the, uh, what was I going to say? Like the, I can't think of the word. I'm drawing a blank. No, but cool. um, yeah, but uh, essentially like the, um, like the stuff that leads up to the, the disease, the risk factors, sorry. The risk factors of the disease um, are essentially all of the things that are killing our society anyway, right? Like high, uh, high blood pressure, heart disease, right. uh, type two diabetes. Underlying, underlying illnesses yeah. that are coming. Everything that essentially, you know, you should be working on. Well, yeah. not everybody, like there's certain people that get those and they, you know, they were healthy. Um, or they tried to live a healthy lifestyle or whatever genetics, but, but for the most part, um, that's, you know, lifestyle diseases. And, um, and so that was the biggest risk factor where all these lifestyle diseases and and we were seeing patients come in that had all those, you know, and then they also had flu like symptoms, but they tested negative for for the flu. And I, you know, I started to kind of get upset. I was like, you know, if us as a society took, you know, took better care of ourselves, then, you know, we wouldn't, then all these people wouldn't even have to come in here and then, and then put the, the healthcare workers at risk. Cause that's right. why I was kind of upset because essentially we had like all these signs on the front door. It was like, you know, um, if you have these signs and symptoms, don't come in, call, and then we'll like prepare for you. And these people would come in and then I would be checking them and I'd be talking to them, like talking to you, but like five feet away. Yeah no social distancing or anything like that. And then like halfway through the conversation, they'd be like, Oh, I have a cough. I, you know, I had a fever, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, well, didn't you see the signs? And like, they didn't care, you know? And the reason that they were there was to get their blood pressure medicine or their type two diabetes medicine or whatever. And I'm just like, well, you know, not only did they not care about that, but they, you know, if we cared about each other as a society, you know, then we would take care of ourselves because not only, you know, with everything going on with COVID, like you have to go into a healthcare provider and get your medicine or go into a doctor and get, and, or if you have COVID, you have to go to a hospital or something like that. Like you're spreading it to healthcare workers and, and, and everything. So you're putting them at risk just because your health is at risk. Yeah. And then at the same time, like our, you know, our healthcare, um, like just the amount that we spend on healthcare in general as a society, like, I mean, it's, in, it's insane. It's and, one of the and highest in the world. Yeah. And it's, and it's mainly, and it's personal responsibility. Um, and people don't like hearing that. Um, but like you want to know because they have to be accountable to themselves. That's no good. No. And so Medicare, and I think like the big argument is like, Oh, we want to want to give everybody healthcare. And I agree like, yeah, let's give everybody healthcare, but let's also make everybody responsible for their health. And we'll bring down the bill in an insane amount. Like if everybody was healthy, then, then we could definitely afford healthcare for all, but not like the way that we're, the, the trajectory that we're going like you yeah. can't expect the world to, or the united states to just care for every single person if the person isn't going to care for you know yeah. the society in general yeah. you right? got to be a part of the pro- uh, part of the process you know yeah as a as a trainer uh, i always tell my clients that i said you know i can give you all the information that you need yeah. if you're not part of the process it doesn't work yeah so, oh damn yeah. you know like all of a sudden <laughs> they're not so interested anymore yeah. So I was on one of those runs, those three hour runs. And I was thinking about that. And then, um, I'm sure you've heard of David Goggins. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. So I was running and I was listening to somebody else's podcast while I was running on one of these morning runs. And they were like, you know, if you haven't you know, read or listened to David Goggins book and you can't afford it, like I'll pay for it for you right now. Just call this number. And I was like, if this guy's willing to like, you know, pay for the book, it must be super important. So I downloaded it, the audio version while I was on this run and, uh, and started listening to it. And he essentially in, in his book, um, uh, challenges you to do like that impossible task, like that you, you know, you think is crazy and everybody yeah. else would think is crazy. And, um, and so by like 6am, you know, this was a four hour run day, I think for me. So by 6am, you know, I'm running toward back to the house and I'm like, you know what, I think I'm going to run to Mount Mitchell, uh, 500 miles, um, in two weeks and raise some money for, for, 
for people that are that lost their jobs and can't pay their bills because a, a bunch of people at this point had gotten furloughed from my work and in Wilmington a ton of people had gotten furloughed and and unemployment wasn't kicking in yet like it had been like a few weeks people, bills were due mortgages were due yeah. and I had a couple of friends that couldn't pay their bill literally, literally they, they were living paycheck to paycheck you know and um, so I was like I'll just raise some money and then it kind of turned into this huge thing a friend was like um, hey maybe you should run to you know um, California and I was like all right. So I actually left six days after I decided to do it. And I decided to do it on that day that I listened to get the first like hour and a half of David Goggins book. Um, and uh, I told my fiance that day, I told my boss that day. Um, and he just had to have somebody else that had been furloughed come back. So it wasn't a big deal for him. Yeah. Um, and, he, and he was like, yeah, you could do it. And at this point I was just running to Mount Mitchell when I told him. Yeah. And so I had to go back two days later and be like, actually, I think I'm going to run to California. My yeah, a little, a little change of plans. <laughs> Well, a yeah. small change in plans. Yeah. So somebody was supposed to come with me. Um, and uh, the guy that, that originally had told me to go to California was supposed to come with me. And, uh, and he decided like, hey, it's a pandemic. Like we're not supposed, we're supposed to be social distancing. We're not supposed to be doing stuff like this. Like, I don't think I can go. And, uh, and I was like, well, I have to go. He's like, well, can't we go like in January or something when this is all over? And I was like, no, man, I'm trying to raise money for people now. You know, I'm trying to motivate people. That was another goal was just to motivate people. Like if they see me doing something crazy, maybe they can wake up at six and go for a little run before work or something. Yeah. And then, you know, better society. And, and reduce the risk factors for COVID. And so, um, so I was like, we can social distance. I'm going to stay on the side of the highway. Like we can just eat beans and rice. I'll put an instant pot on the, in the van or something, you know? Yeah. And, uh, and he freaked out and he's just like, I can't do it. So, um, so I went and I got a stroller, a baby stroller. And I took off by myself um, at 8 p.m. six days after I decided to do it. And I ran 61 miles in the first 24 hours. It was wild. I was sleeping on the side of the highway. I was doing polyphasic sleeping where I was sleeping, you know, for 30 minutes every six hours. It was crazy stuff. Oh, my um, goodness. Yeah, yeah. So, and I did that all the way till I got to Georgia. And then, um, and then he decided uh, he was going to come out and cause he didn't think I was being safe. And so he came out for a little while and then he ended up in Atlanta. He's like, I can't, I can't do this, man. So he went back home and then, um, and then I hired a driver to come out through like yeah. some third party business person that I knew. Yeah. And he was like, Oh, we'll have a business partner cover it at some point. And I was like, okay, cool. And, uh, and so then I got a bill for like five grand after cool. like two weeks. And I was like, I thought, you know, somebody was going to cover this yeah. and it didn't occur and like that at all so i had to send him home so then i was by myself again with a pack for for a few states um i had a 25 pound pack on um, and then finally my fiance came out when we got to nashville um and uh and she uh she's been with me so she stays at the hotel she works the whole time um she works for biotech she did the same thing that i was gonna that i was doing um she she actually enjoys it um and uh and so she works all day and then I run all day. And then if, you know, I can't make it to the hotel for some reason, if it's too far, then she'll pick me up and then she'll drop me back off in the morning the next day. So she's like, it's crazy. Some days she has to drive two hours, you know, drop me off, drive back to the hotel, work all day and then pick me up again. Like well, that is, that is yeah. a team effort. There's no question about that. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So, wow. Yeah. I, I was wondering how that, you know, that dynamic, how that worked out. Yeah. It's how, pretty crazy. How, how um, um, what's the average that you run per day? Yeah. So when I first started, I was running like 60 miles a day, um, 50 to 60 wow. miles a day. The most I've ran in one day is 71 miles. Um, that was on, uh, on Memorial day. I ran up grandfather mountain and then I ran around Chattanooga in circles, ran to the Memorial. Um, I was on every news station in Chattanooga for it, um, 71 miles in 24 hours. Um, and then, um, after Chattanooga, I kind of slowed down a little bit cause I was going through the mountains. Um, and now I'm averaging somewhere around 30. I did 36 yesterday. Um, there was one day in, uh, in um, Kentucky where I ran for, uh, I ran 28 miles. Um, I got to like the river that separates Illinois and Kentucky. And, uh, and there, was a, there was a ferry. And that was the only way across. I had to run 100 miles if I wanted to go across a different way. It was crazy. Yeah. And the ferry was shut down because the winds were too bad. Um, and uh, and the, this farmer comes up to me he's just like a farm lion and he's like yeah man i don't think they're gonna i don't think they're gonna open today and i was like 
and there's like this little like uh, metal like thing that you could sit in and it kind of blocked the wind. I was like, I guess I'm sleeping here, you know? And so I'm just sitting there for like two hours and then he comes back and he's like, man, <laughs> the ferry was coming over and I didn't even see it. He's like, oh, they're here to get me. And I didn't even know he was the owner of the ferry. Oh my! <laughs> so the, and he and he lived on the other side, so he was just messing with me. <laughs> so like they yeah. they had to come get him regardless of the wind. And yeah. so he took me to the other side. I got to the other side, and I hadn't eaten since six a.m. and it was like eight p.m. or something like that. And Illinois was completely shut down due to COVID. Oh completely, my. like this the town that I got to was completely shut down. There wasn't anything open. So I got over there, and I couldn't run anywhere else. Like I, it was like ten or ten or eleven at night. And, um, and so, uh, I didn't have like any food with me. I didn't bring any food cause I thought I'd run into a gas station and I didn't the whole trip. Yeah. And so I actually didn't eat. I, uh, I found a Coke machine and I had a $1 bill. I had a bunch of twenties, but I had a $1 bill, bought a Coke and that was my dinner. I had to run 13 miles the next day, um, just to get you know, breakfast. Like you that was what? probably the craziest day. <laughs> and that, that's a really good example of how motivation and discipline, what you can do when you have those two things. Yeah, well, and, I needed to get food too. So. And, uh, and uh, <laughs> listen, running. for you to be able to do that, I would imagine there's a obvious, there's a certain passion that you have for mm -hmm. what you're doing. I mean, you have to have yeah. that in order to tolerate the, the stuff that you're going through. I was going to ask you how, yeah. you know, if you were just really paying close attention as to how you were fueling your body, but you just answered the question that it's not always a, a, a perfect storm for you when you're out there, is it? No, no, no. So I, uh, a lot of the states I've run through, I've run through like the part where it's like a food desert. Essentially, the only thing they have is um, like Dollar Generals and gas stations. Yeah. Um, and they don't have good food there. If you want a banana, it costs like a dollar twenty-five at a gas station. Like that's not yeah. feasible, you know? Right. So, um, so actually there was about, I don't even know, like six states where essentially I was just running gas station to gas station. It was mainly the times when I was by myself because I couldn't, I didn't have a vehicle to get like to a, to a, um, a restaurant or anything. Yeah. So if I ran to a, if I ran up on a gas station, I had to eat because I didn't know when the next gas station yeah. was going to be, you know? Yeah. And, um, and so I, at first I tried to eat like vegetables and stuff, fruits. Um, and, uh, and there's just so much fiber in it that like I would have to take a minute to digest it. And I wasn't getting enough calories because I was burning like 10,000 calories a day. Yeah. So I actually just started eating ice cream. Um, out of nowhere. I was a vegetarian when I started, vegan when I started, and then I went like vegetarian. It's like, I'm going to eat some ice cream. Let me try this out. So there was a point where essentially I would stop at a gas station. I would get six ice cream bars. I would eat them all within yeah. like five minutes. And then I would just keep running. And right. it like, it didn't mess with my digestion. Like yeah. it was like, all, it seemed like a perfect fuel. Like, and that was perfect. Um, and so I was like, Oh, whatever. Like I can just run on whatever. And I think my body was just so deprived. Like it didn't matter. And ice cream just so it digests so fast, you know? So it's actually, um, it's on, believe it or not, when you eat ice cream and hopefully you were eating ice cream, they had full fat, high fat. Yeah. Because yeah. it's one of the best complex carbohydrates that you can actually eat. All right, let's take a quick break so I can tell you about our product. Do you want a bone crushing grip? Good, because you're gonna get one with the amazing new TRS Gripper. It's a progressive grip builder with longer handles and a special ergonomic design that's like a dozen hand grippers in one. Start off easy and work your way up to quickly build your grip strength from wet noodle to pulverizing. The package includes a video from the world famous strength coach, Dr. Russ Horine, the man who worked with Leo Costa to help bring you Big Beyond Belief in the Bulgarian Power Burst. Dr. Horine shows you a simple and easy to follow workout plan that takes just minutes a day right from in front of your TV set if you want. So click on the link below and let's get started building you a stronger, firmer, bone crushing grip. Yeah, and I that. and I also read, and I don't know if this is true or not, but like milk is actually uh, a superior hydration form. I, I don't know if it's 100 percent true, but I like read it. I was yeah. like, oh, that makes sense. Maybe I tricked my mind into well, thinking that. And the, so, the, the, the the most important thing is the result that you're getting, whether it's placebo or not. Yeah, to tell you the yeah. Truth. So, no, so that I was pretty wild. Yeah, I learned that with uh, you know, like a baked potato, which you would think is a lot yeah. more healthy than uh, ice cream, but uh -huh. a baked potato without butter 
is uh, is way worse for you as a as an energy source than ice cream with fat in it. You know, so you yeah, yeah. I've done yeah, I've done like full on ketogenic diets before, oh, okay. and and it's, so I know a little bit about that stuff. But yeah, yeah. Um, and I've done fasting before. The the longest I've ever gone without food is like. 11, 12 days. So, yeah. so I, did I've, that. Like, I did that too. Like, I, did, I did it for seven yeah. days. It was interesting. Yeah. Really yeah. Was. And you feel, you feel amazing. So you know. like, so you know. like I, it's on this run. Yeah. So the run where I was like 28 miles and then had to run, like, I didn't feel bad. Like, I don't want anybody thinking like I was like dying running the right. last 13 miles. Like I was yeah. fully energized. Like I was yeah. perfect. So, yeah. um, so it really wasn't like, it's a cool story. And it like, everybody's like, Oh man, that's crazy. But it's like in my head, I was probably perfectly now, fine. All as you uh, did you, do you always, do you do like a run and do you ever walk or is it constantly running? When you stop running, you just so, stop. Yeah. So I didn't, ru- I didn't walk at all until I got to Illinois. Um, and then I was like, I was by myself and I was like, oh man. So like, I was like, I ran 30 miles one day and I was like, I still had like 10 or 20 to go mm. and I was kind of tired. So I started walking a little bit, but then like I saw somebody like that saw me and I was like, Oh man, they saw me walking. So like yeah. I started running again. I really try not to walk every once in a while. Like somebody will catch me walking. I'm like, dang it, man. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, but I mean, I'm putting in, you know, at some points I was putting in close to 200 miles a week. I mean, that's running. I like, I don't track anything that's not a run. So on my Strava, that's a running app. Yeah. Um, you can see all the runs. If it's not on there, it's because I was walking. So I probably walked close to maybe a hundred miles out of yeah. the eighteen hundred. Um, yeah. So you're but, still putting in a certain amount of miles running, regardless. Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like I don't. I, it's a run. Um, it's just if I get you know tired and I and I'm a normal person too. You know, <laughs> some days I don't want to run. Of you course. Know? <laughs> yeah. You know, I did something when I got into. Uh, I, I decided that I wanted to walk from my house to the coast and oh, really? me walking and me doing stuff like that, just really out of my comfort zone, but it, I got a wild yeah. hair, you know? And uh-huh. so I thought, well, I'll first do, I'm going to walk from my house to the airport, which is about uh, 10 miles away. Yeah. Let me make sure that I've got that right. Eight to 10 miles away. Uh, uh-huh. I got to tell you something, Russell. I just walked. By the time I got my ass to that, uh, to that uh, airport, my uh-huh. body was hurting so <laughs> freaking bad yeah. i couldn't believe it yeah. i was just walking yeah. that's wild oh yeah my. walking walking it actually believe it or not walking is worse than running so like when i stop to walk my body hurts worse when i'm walking than i'm running and my feet hurt 10 times oh, worse man. when i walk than i run because like the uh, like the pressure because you're putting way more pressure on your feet because when you're running you're constantly in the air that's when that's you're walking a, you put the point. full weight of yourself on the on your foot and so like yeah. i can't walk for more than like a mile I'm like i have to oh. run because yeah, okay. yeah. I, I, as i was walking i'm thinking okay now this is ridiculous I'm working this yeah way. i'm walking yeah and yeah. I thought, well, you're also, you also said you're 200 pounds. Yeah. I used to be a hot, I, I never made it to 200, but the most I was ever at was 198. Um, yeah. I was benching like 305 back then. Yeah, yeah that, just, it didn't help that I was uh, that heavy, but yeah. I thought yeah. I was actually going to walk back to my house. I called, I, I yeah. called somebody else and said, come get my ass. I'm not doing this anymore. That was the That's last hilarious. thing I walked like I didn't, I did not walk to the coast, nor do I ever want to do that. It's hard enough to drive the damn thing. Anyway, you okay, run. So, as you're raising money for all this, how does that work are, are people yeah is there like- so originally originally it was for it was for veterans that were affected by covid um and then pretty pretty fast i realized that like yeah there were a lot of veterans that are affected by covid but there are a lot of veterans that were struggling way before covid and like and now like it's even it's even worse and and um and so i ran into a veteran friend i'm not going to say his name but um but i ran into him and uh and we had dinner and I went to his house and I saw this, he had a nice house and he had a nice, super nice like bike and a super nice like car and stuff like this. And I'm like, Oh dude, this guy's made it. You know, he's doing awesome. Yeah. And I find out like a week later from another person that like this veterans, like he's in foreclosure in his house. Like oh, boy. He, his bike had been, or his truck had been repoed. Like, and it was all because like his wife had cheated on him in Afghanistan. And then they went, they had like a custody battle. Um, and he had to spend like thousands and thousands of dollars on a lawyer fees and he didn't end up winning. And so like he wanted a debt for that and then he couldn't pay his mortgage. And so, um, fortunately because of COVID and everything, if you're having, if you're struggling with mortgages right now, like you, the government will help you out, especially yeah. if it's a government back to loan. So I told him about that and he got like a three month, like furlough on his loan. So that was amazing for him. He got a little break. Um, but like, I realized like, like, like if he's struggling and I thought he was like, 
doing well. Yeah. You know, like you then know. there's probably, there's so many veterans out there struggling and we don't talk about it. Like I was telling like earlier, like when I was going through my depression, like I didn't talk about it. You know, I feel like people should have recognized it and maybe talked to me, but like, yeah. and they didn't do that. So there's a whole different dynamic there. But um, after that, I'd realized like, you know, there's just so many veterans struggling. And then, and then the, the 20, the mission 22, um, everything going on with that, like 20 veterans commit suicide every day. Like it's, I mean, it's an epidemic. I mean, like, mm-hmm. like, like these, these veterans, like they serve their country and it's mostly, I mean, I imagine it's mostly combat veterans that like come back and they don't have like that tribe. Um, yeah. uh, they don't come back to a community. Nobody really respects what they did. Nobody. And even if, uh, if not that, then, then, and nobody knows what they did yeah. and they and it's kind of it's weird it's a weird thing because we're not in that tribe uh tribal mentality anymore we don't like live in tribes so you go to war you come back nobody knows you went to war so you feel like you have to tell people to get yeah. that acknowledgement like that's yeah. not how it was back in the day like if you were living in a tribe or a community like if you went to war and you came back everybody in the community knew like you sure. went to war right yeah. that's yeah. not the case anymore so then like the veterans have to like feel like they have to tell people which they don't really want to do they just want yeah. to be you know somewhat acknowledged for their, their purpose they don't have a sense of purpose anymore most of them stop working out they don't have any kind of exercise routine which i think just completely changes your entire mentality and i'm sure you do too yeah. um so that was kind of it switched from like a covid thing to more of a hey we're raising awareness for veterans that are committing suicide we want to reduce that um to zero, you know, yeah. and, and the way that we want to do that is to motivate veterans to get outside and exercise because that's the cheapest and the easiest way. You don't have to go talk to a therapist. I mean, that would be awesome if you did, but I think the number one thing is for you to get outside and get a dopamine rush from a run, right. Yeah. Or a workout or whatever. Yeah. And, um, and then also, uh, finances, you know, I, I, I left the Marine Corps with a 525, um, credit score like it was horrible um i got i, I got talked into a loan with a, for a car that was 18 percent interest rate didn't know what interest was i was 18 years old yeah. guy it's illegal actually to do that <laughs> um to do that to a veteran or to a to a military person and uh and so i didn't know that you know so um ended up you know just racking up credit cards and so i got out and, uh, and I was like, I have to fix this. And it took me like eight years. I had yeah. to get like, I had to pay off all that debt. I had to pay it off. I couldn't just like leave it. Um, and then, so I used like the money I made in Afghanistan to do that. And then, and most people would never do that, which is an issue. Um, and then, and then after I paid it off, I had to get one of the secure credit cards, right. For, yeah. I had to put a thousand dollars in it. Yeah. yeah. And so, and I had to use it and use it. And then a year later I had to increase it. And then a year later I had to increase it and finally I got a real credit card. And then finally, like I, and every year since then I've increased my limit, my limit, I have like over a hundred thousand dollars in credit card limit and my, I have like a zero balance now and my credit is outstanding, but that took like eight years. Yeah. Um, and it, and, and most veterans, especially combat veterans don't have any kind of like financial literacy at all. Yeah. And so we want to both a, you know, help veterans understand like how important that is. And to kind of give a little bit of a reset button, I didn't get a reset button. Luckily, you know, I went to Afghanistan and you got some tax free money and you didn't spend it. So like I could, I could pay off all those bills when I got back and I just started there, but most veterans don't do that. They come back, they buy a nice car and then, you know, right. they end up not being able to afford the nice car, you know, yeah. 10, like five, five months later because they have a $500 car payment. They didn't realize like they couldn't really afford that, yeah. which is pretty much exactly what happened to me. Yeah. Um, and so, so yeah, so both those two things, raising awareness for veterans that are, um, that are, you know, depressed or anxious and, and, and are at risk for, for veteran suicide and then trying to motivate them, um, to, uh, to exercise and then raise, uh, funds for, for veterans that, that need like a little, just a little reset, um, mainly on large bills like uh, mortgages and stuff like that. Yeah. But, but yeah. Well, so. listen, you are doing a noble uh, cause, and I applaud you uh, for that. And before we leave the show, if you have, do you have a website or something that you can direct uh, our our viewers to to yeah, help out? Yeah, yeah. It's it's just uh, veteransforgood.org, um, and and you can easily find me. It's run Russell run for the run. Um, Instagram, Facebook. I was on Fox News like two weeks ago. Nice. Um, so if you type "run Russell run" in on Google, I'll come up. And uh, and Veterans for Good. We were using GoFundMe's, but GoFundMe actually takes a large portion of the donation. Um, so we're we're using the the Veterans for Good website now. Um, and uh, and you can choose. 
Uh, one more thing, we're also, my dog is running, uh, not the whole thing, but partly. She's a, it's a Siberian Husky, and, uh, and she's running for an organization called Dogs for Our Brave, and they take rescue animals and turn them into, uh, rehabilitate them into uh, service dogs for veterans. Nice. Um, yeah, so, so she's raising money for that, and you can choose what you want your money to go to when you donate on the website, um, and that's one of the organizations. So if we raise $20,000 20, for Dogs for Our Brave, you get to name the dog that goes to the veteran. And so um, there's a page, Run Russell Run, on Facebook, and I'll have everybody, once we raise that much money, then uh, then I'll have everybody kind of vote on, on what we name the dog. So that'll be pretty cool. Fantastic, man. Listen, yeah. uh, I, I, as I said at the beginning of the show, I, I really appreciate you taking out you know, your time. You could be down. Now, by now, we've been into this thing an hour. You could be like 10 miles down the road or something. I could have been a, about, a, about a halfway to Boulder, which is 20, 24 miles away. So. <laughs> Like that night, so I appreciate you coming on the show. And no, no, I appreciate you, man. Yeah, I really do. <laughs> continued success, and you know, if something comes up down the road, reach out to us, and uh, you know, we got something else that we can talk about. I think you have a fantastic yeah. story, and I'm really proud of you, man. So you be safe out there. I appreciate it. I really, right. really am grateful that you. That you no, no, me man. To you take on. care of yourself. All right, you too. See ya. Bye. Good job. <laughs> thank you you got a lot to say that's a lot of stuff good stuff man yeah sorry if i was talking way too no, much i don't know if i no, answered no, all no. your questions no it's, <laughs> it's good i i'm glad that you did that i you know there's some really interesting and fantastic people out there uh, doing stuff and it's uh, always yeah. nice to that's one of the things i like about podcasting because i get to talk to a lot of different peoples from a lot of different people's people from a lot of different uh, of life and yeah. people are pretty fascinating and you know we there's those out there, the bad apples, but there's a lot of yeah. seeing people out there. You know, it's pretty cool when you get the. That's very true. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Off to, off to dress for success like you did. Right on, time. baby. All right. <laughs> All right I'll yourself. talk to you later. All right. Have a good one. Right. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Serious Growth Podcast. For more episodes like the one you just listened to, subscribe to us on your mobile podcast app and leave us a review. If you'd like to reach out, you can find us online at seriousgrowth.com. Until next time, train smart and train hard.